Good day, folks, and welcome to another edition of Lumberjack Logic. I'm your host, Neil Johnson, and I am so excited to bring you this show. I'm out in the great state of New Hampshire, and we have some special guests for you today. There's a case that's taking place out here that's had some twists and turns. We've been following this on this channel, but this is going to change elections, not only for New Hampshire, but for the entire nation. And there was a brown groundbreaking decision that just took place in the great state of Idaho. So I'm going to bring in some special guests here. I've got Dan Richards to my right, and Dan is the one who filed the litigation here in New Hampshire. I've got Tom Murray and uh, Ken Eyring there of the Government Integrity Government Integrity Project out here in New Hampshire. So welcome, guys, to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I am. Oh, I'm excited about this show. I do need to mention my sponsor really quick before we get going, and I just want to mention Midas Gold Group. That's MidasGoldGroup.com. Or you can text Lumberjack to 232425 to receive free silver with qualifying order. You can also call them at 480-360-3000. I'm going to tell you what. I know you own some gold. I own a couple pieces. Yeah. And, and and silver. And I have been so pleased with the returns of late. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, but I mean, it's funny. All oh, the, record highs. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Country's going to gold-backed currency yeah. because, you know, it's the one way to stop the U.S. from destroying their currency. Yeah. yeah. Is that when it's backed by. So that's going to create more demand, I think, throughout the world. People have to make their own investment decisions. But I'm a fan. So MidasGoldGroup.com or text Lumberjack to 232425. I'm going to actually start this show. We're going to share a clip, a news clip, out of Idaho to give people what happened, what just took place in Idaho. And I know you're really excited about this, Dan, because this is affecting your case here in New Hampshire. So if Juan can just bring that up, and we're going to watch that news clip right now. Or not. Okay, it says stretch it out. So, But the, the, the thing that took place in Idaho... Uh, we have a decision that affects standing. And one of the things that's happened to us time and time again in election cases is we're told we don't have standing. We're the citizens of the freaking country, yeah. of the state where these court cases are being tried, and we're constantly told we don't have standing. This is why all these cases with Trump were thrown out on right. standing. standing. Right. Laws are being broken, but the judges are saying, well, you know, if you can't prove that it affects you, Oh, then we're going to ignore that the laws are being broken. How insane is that in a constitutional if, republic? If we don't have standing, who does? That's what they asked you. That's exactly right. And, you know, the funny part about the standing issue is, uh, as the judge said to me, he says, if Mr. Richard doesn't have standing, who does? That's right. That's yeah. right. And so yeah. it's absurd, but uh, it is the status quo. All right. Here All we right. go. Well, today, the Idaho Supreme Court upheld a couple of Idaho voting laws passed during the 2023 legislative session. The decision comes after a couple of local advocacy groups sued the Secretary of State's office last year, claiming the laws violated Idahoans, especially young Idahoans, constitutional right to vote. Abby Davis spoke with people on both sides of this lawsuit and obviously polar opposite reactions to today's ruling, Abby. Right, as you can expect. One of the organizations, Babe Vote, says they're crushed. But the Secretary of State's office says the court's decision helps protect the, helps protect the integrity of the voting process. I'm voter here registering to vote. The most like direct and clear, you know, like legally outlined way to truly make your voice heard in a democracy is through voting. And for the last three years, Boise High Junior Yvonne Shen has helped Idahoans do just that. She registers people through her volunteer work with Babe Vote, a youth voting advocacy group. I am technically not a voting age yet, but obviously I think like it's a super important thing to protect and we're kind of seeing that getting attacked right now, which is unfortunate. She's partly talking about a new Idaho Supreme Court decision. The court upheld a lower court's decision dismissing a Babe Vote and League of Women Voters lawsuit against the Secretary of State's office. We were very disappointed. The organization sued over the constitutionality of two laws passed last year. Those laws banned student IDs as a form of voter identification, specified what other type of identification was allowed, and gave people without a driver's license the option to get a free ID card. They help make Idaho's voter registration and ID laws consistent and uniform across the board. Before, Secretary of State spokesperson Chelsea Caratini says there was a lot of confusion. People could show a Costco card to vote or a scuba ID to vote, and this delineates what ID is 
acceptable. In the opinion released Thursday, the court states the laws are reasonable exercises of the legislature's authority under the state constitution. Babe Vote thinks it's another way to stop young people from getting involved. The legislature basically did a surgical attack on a group of voters, students. It's just frustrating, especially for me as like a young person, kind of seeing like, oh, it's almost like they're kind of targeting our generation in a sense. Caratini says they're letting people who previously voted with a student ID know they can get that free ID that I mentioned earlier. But Babe Vote says that that process takes a lot of time and that's something a lot of young adults just don't have, Brian. Abby, uh, Justice Robin Brody wrote the uh, opinion today and said to the point that every voting rule imposes some sort of burden and, this, and the legislature didn't double down on that basically. So I guess the question is what's next for Babe Vote? Right, well, this is, this is essentially the end of the road for this lawsuit, but the board member did say that they are going to try and just fight against some of these, they call them obstacles, to getting younger people voting and out to the polls. All right, we'll see what happens. All right, thank you very much, Abby. Well, all right, so there's a lot to unpack there. Just in that decision alone, and we've still got to you know, address New Hampshire, but I think... Let me just ask the question here. Are all of you guys against young people voting? No, not at all. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Quali qualified not. voters. Yeah, qualified. Okay. And, le and let me correct that young lady. We don't live in a democracy. We live in a constitutional republic. Thank you. Know the difference. I, I was going to address that. It's a real concern. People, yeah. people seem to uh, lack knowledge in that area. But with this, Dan, I want you to talk specifically about your case. Now, you just filed a new... Um, was it a... No, I filed an objection with the court's motion. The court, um, four months... Let me back up a second. When I had oral arguments before the New Hampshire Supreme Court on November 29th, the court closed the case, which is what they do when they're done. S slide this over a little more. We're going to need some more volume on you, I can tell. How about that? Yeah, better. All right. So what the court did is the uh, after oral arguments, the court takes into consideration that what's been briefed and argued before the court. So in my case, they did so and waited four months. After four months, instead of raising the issue of standing uh, at that time, which was what, what happened to me, the, the state had, no, had, had not briefed standing. So they raised the issue of standing in oral arguments and chose not to follow up. No one followed up. So four months later, when the court figures out that these, uh, many of these people are in a compromised situation, they're looking for a way out. Gotcha. Do you, uh, um, and, and I watched, I, so I've, I've seen some of your oral arguments before the Supreme Court. Now, you filed this as a pro se litigant. And I think this is, this is, I want you to talk just a little bit about that aspect of this, because I think so many people are wondering, what can I do? What can I do? And the fact is that there are a lot of attorneys who don't want to take this on. And a lot of attorneys don't want to take this on because they're seeing people actually lose their law license by simply standing up for safe and secure elections. But you took it on pro se, which simply means that he filed the case himself. And how hard was that? Um, what kind of background did you have to do that? Can you just tell people a little bit about that process? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, my background is I'm a police dog trainer. I used to manage a federal agency. So I had 10 bomb dogs under my command at Department of Energy. And I've spent my adult life training police dogs. And a big part of that is, from administrative law is understanding the rules of procedure, the laws that must be followed. So that was my background in law from a, a practical application. You know, whenever a police dog is used in the line of duty, the opposing counsel will go through your training records. So it's important that if you want to uphold, especially a narcotics conviction or a criminal apprehension, you want to make sure that your, your ducks are in a row there. So that's how I got to understand the, the basics of a practical application of the law. And from there, I had my own personal interest where I started studying the U.S. Constitution and the background and came to understand that much of what we've been taught isn't what really this you know it's not what we think it is so that's how i began my journey of self-education and that process led me to understanding that a great many of our election laws have been changed without the consent of the voters which is mandatory under our state constitution we have a protected right not only to vote but also the prohibition that the state can't change its election laws without the consent of the governed now I, one thing that I've, I've always been frustrating on is not only standing, but they always talk about case law. 
Now, some things seem very plain in the text of the Constitution. So what are we waiting on case law for? But yet what Idaho did was give us case law. Correct? Absolutely. And it's going to be very useful in my case. Um, to follow up where I was on that, on, on the point about my background, also is the issue of pro se, is that it leaves me in an adva- advantageous situation. And what I mean by that is that those who are admitted to the bar are all bound by its oversight, the oversight of the Supreme mm-hmm. Court. So many people in, in this small state won't take on these cases because if it implicates any of the deep state here in New Hampshire, it, it could cost them their, their, their livelihood. So I don't have that same limitation. I'm not constrained by worried about speaking up for myself and speaking the truth. So that restriction, I'm, I'm, I'm uninhibited by that restriction that would apply to most lawyers. The other thing is uh, it took a tremendous amount. It's taken 10 years of my life to acquire enough knowledge to be able to bring this case. I had one attorney say to me, Dan, if we had to pay you for the amount of research that you've conducted, we could have never afforded you because the billable hours, because of the tremendous, again, years of my life of researching the subject matter. And what's different about my approach is I do everything backwards as a dog trainer. And so I start with the fundamental law. Lawyers start with case precedent. And that's the big distinction between coming to a different conclusion. An attorney who takes a case on behalf of his client has a fiduciary duty to know what the last case had to say about the subject matter he's litigating. Because if he doesn't follow the precedent, he can be disbarred for, uh, for legal malpractice. Because it's understood fundamentally that when a court rules on a matter and establishes precedent, unless the moving party can convince the court that the past precedent is bad, it stays. And that's right. and that's bad because when you have judges who legislate from the bench, you've set the you've set the path of our rights down the wrong, in the wrong direction essentially. And that's well, where the trespass of our rights begin. Absolutely, right. that's and where add, our constitution add, comes into play. And when you add the complexity of that, the expense of all of this, if you look at the amount of billable hours involved for standing up for yourself, it's cost prohibitive. Right, So unless you can afford to hire the best law firm in the state who is, quite frankly, unwilling to represent you anyway, leaving us in a quandary, That's right. leaving us in an, an ability where we can't even bring our cases. And, and, and of course, it's absurd. But this new decision that we are talking about today is the Idaho decision on voter ID. And that case there is a big time case on voter standing. And yep. it will be applicable in my case and and so that's why this case is so important. So it's taken years for these cases to come about, but as they're being heard from the various state supreme courts, they're coming down the right way. Right. And Neil, you pointed out and we we talked about this for a couple hours before we actually started your podcast. You pointed out that if this case that we're talking about now had been ruled on before the 2020 election, all of those cases that were dismissed would have had to have been heard. That's right, because of Moore v. Harper that came down last summer in 23-63 decision, um, you know, which built on the Bruin case, which built on the Heller case. So all these cases are being now um, in, in front of the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's ruling the correct way. And so... I think it's, I, I would have loved to have rewound the clock and had that Moore v. Harper case come to us before 2020 because when, I think we'd be all speaking a different uh, tune right now. When people say that all those cases were dismissed and all the evidence was denied, you know, was, was looked at and refuted, that's not the case. No, that's Those false. cases were never heard. That evidence was never presented yeah. before the justices. No. It was a, it was saying you don't have standing. We're not gonna. That's right. We're gonna stop right there. Summarily dismissed. Summarily dismiss it. That's my problem. You know, right. I'm not saying there was fraud. I'm saying there's evidence out there, and you didn't even look at it and acknowledge it. Right. And in Dan's case, he's saying the same thing. However, after the fact, after oral arguments been had, closed, book done, go make your decision. They're coming back and having this extraordinary response. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, they're realizing they have a weak position and they didn't handle it right. So now right. they want, as you put it, Dan, a second bite of the apple. Right, and, this, and they're asking the for apple. amicus briefs. Okay, exactly. So this, I want to go to that right yeah, now. Yeah. There, I'm this, sorry, we kind of took you off your path. No, no, no this, is, uh, this is so important because basically the Supreme Court of New Hampshire violated its own rules. procedures, That's rules, right. whatever, okay, and said, hey, uh, the, you know, everybody can come back with amicus briefs now. Uh, because, you know, apparently... The state didn't do a good enough job in the yeah, first place. Yeah, you know, we're just going to give them mulligan. <laughs> Who can give the, them help? The state sucked so We need clear. someone better than our own AG. <laughs> <laughs> it's just unbelievable to me. So talk about that. You're yeah, fight. yeah. Let me explain two, two things to your audience. Number one, standing. What is the legal definition of standing? We'll get that out of the way. The issue of standing is what should have happened in the Donald Trump Letitia James case, right? Where was the injured party? It's a fundamental basic of, a, of American common law as it has evolved that in order to bring a case in a court, you must prove there's a controversy. And the controversy is an injury in fact, right? You have to prove how. So if you do a slip and fall, you can say, hey, I slip and fell. It's on the video camera. I went to the urgent care. Right. They conduce that I have a broken leg or A, B, or C, whatever, however you harmed yourself. So that's a tangible physical injury. When we talk about harming our rights, now we get into a whole can of worms. And so what's happened for years, we were talking about this before the podcast, what's been happening to us for years in American courts, what's happened is the courts have applied means and scrutiny when evaluating any of your enumerated rights. And what that means is if you claim that your right to vote has been unduly infringed or harmed, you, um, you are then faced with having to prove to the court how that process has harmed you in any way. And so that's how, that's how this is uh, playing itself out in our election laws. And so the standing, like I said, the standing issue is what's now being raised. So what happened in my case, the state, when it uh, filed its brief in the lower court, argued standing for, that I lack standing from beginning to end in the lower court. But when I appealed to the state Supreme Court, they didn't. They didn't they didn't brief standing, they didn't talk about standing. Why? Because the standing was obvious. They have a secondary problem. Their secondary problem is if the client if everyone I've accused of doing wrong in this case is guilty of any one of these issues, now they have criminal liability problems. And so the more they say, you know, what's the old maxim on the Miranda warning? Everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So they have to protect the interests of their clients. And I, I suspect that in my case, in the, federal, in the state appeal to the state Supreme Court, that the state took the position that, hey, we're going to say as little as possible. They waived oral arguments. They didn't even want to show up. So during oral arguments, the state Supreme Court questioned them on standing let me back up a second. They didn't question them on him. It was actually the state that raised it during the oral argument as his third concern about my case. And the state Supreme Court did question them on that. And they said, well, listen, you didn't brief standing. Why didn't you brief standing? And they went back and forth for three minutes. But in the end, he doesn't really brief standing other than saying, make excuses for why he didn't do so. And, and, and they and even the said... If yeah. Mr. Richards doesn't have standing, who does? And he doesn't answer the question, did he? The right. state's attorney, gonna, he doesn't gonna, answer gonna, the question. But understand, too, what is, was important is you can raise the standing question at any point in time. And he keyed it up. And the attorney still didn't say, oh, I want to brief standing now. Right. Just come, let it go. Well, Tom, you just teed up the controversy that happens on Friday. So the case is argued. We go back and forth. And then the court did what it always does. It takes the case under advisement. The court will do one of two things when it's going to litigate an appeal. It's either going to render an opinion without oral arguments or authorize oral arguments. And uh, after doing so, hear them, and then the case is closed. The case is closed, and it's under advisement until the court renders an opinion. The amicus curiae process, the, the friend of the court brief process, is, uh, is the second part of this conversation. So normally when you apply for a friend of the court brief, you would do so under the rules established by the court. In this case, the New Hampshire Supreme Court 
Rule 16 provides that if you're going to file an amicus brief, Ken and Tom, if you're going to support my position, you have until I file my brief with the state Supreme Court to give your two cents. If you think you have something relative to say, you can petition the court and ask them to submit a supporting brief. Same with the opposing side. If someone's going to take the, the state's attorney's position and support their position, the cutoff date is when the, brief, was when the state's briefs are due. That preserves for both parties. Due I, process. Due process of law, right? The ability to object, consent to the filing of, of an amicus brief, as well as to be able to argue any arguments that are raised in the amicus brief that weren't prior to the discovery of the entire case going to the appeal uh, to the state Supreme Court. So this is the normal amicus process. It makes it a fair fight. So exactly. what happened? So what happened in my case is that four months go by, and then I get a notice it's, on Friday, right? So I would argue if the court, if the state was convincing, if the state convinced the state's uh, Supreme Court that it could raise standing at any time, and it did, if they were so convincing, why did the court not immediately file a uh, a notice of? the state to file a brief and give them a second bite at the apple. Right. If anybody wants the brief standing, why an amicus versus the plaintiff and the defendant? Shouldn't they be allowed to, to, to brief standing if that be the case? Why are they going outside of the parties and asking members out there to brief We'll get standing? to that. We'll get to that because you raise a great point. If they were going to raise the issue, if the court was going to allow the state raising standing at the last second, yeah. just at the close of oral arguments, then great. You convince them, file a motion for leave of the court for a second bite of the apple to brief standing. And so that begs the question, why didn't they brief standing? And... We're going to get to that in just a second. I got to mention my other sponsor, and I get—I think you were on with Mike Lindell the other day, weren't you? A, a few weeks ago, I was when the case first broke. Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, mypillow.com promo code lumberjack or mypillow.com forward slash lumberjack. Right now, the twenty-five dollar extravaganza is going on. You will not find better deals, and those slide sandals in the white with the nice gel insert are only nine dollars and fifty cents. He got an overrun on those, and. Uh, <clears throat> instead of sending them back he ended up uh selling them out so there's the towels the the roll and go pillows which is one of my favorite products because i take it to the boundary waters i take it elk hunting with me i don't go anywhere without my my pillow guys i don't know about you but my my pillow i gotta have my my pillow so you can also call there is an 800 number uh which i actually like to buy the stuff that way because it's 800-568-2865 i just like talking to people still I just, I do, and I like being able to be advised through the process and find the best product for me. So if you want to try that, it's 800-568-2865. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, I love it. I, uh, I mean, so I, do I. I. Like, I got all his products. I got the sheets. I got the pillows. I got the towels. <laughs> I got the slippers. Like, <laughs> I got it all, man. <laughs> so anyways, but I have a theory on this. I want to see if you like my theory or think that I'm off my rocker, but it almost just seems like they're giving the state a mulligan because they don't want to be forced to rule on this yeah. the way they need to. That's the problem they have now is that because the state chose not to brief standing and this is another problem with the court rules the court rules say that if you're going to open up an amicus brief uh solicitation that you would only be permitting the arguments of of that that which was briefed right if you didn't brief standing you don't right. get to argue standing now you waive that right because yeah. that's what chief justice mcdonald was telling the state by fer by virtue of not briefing it you've waived your ability right. to argue it which is a key a key part of this amicus process, right? right. And I and, and I'm going to go further with your theory because I no. I agree with that theory. I'm going to take the next step, and the next step is if they do go ahead and rule, I think they're going to rule not the way that they're supposed to rule, and they know that this will wind up in U.S. Supreme Court. Right, they're teeing it up for Dan. They're teeing it up. They're the U.S. Supreme up. Court has already decided on a case that's, like this. Exactly, and they know ultimately it, you're going to prevail. You're going to prevail. Yep. So that's the that's the backstory to the controversy. So on Friday, the court went ahead, and uh, I thought I was getting my opinion, and I go and read my email, and I'm looking, thinking to myself, "What do you mean you're soliciting briefs now? You're four months too late." 
If you believe the state's arguments the first time that they wanted to raise the standing issue and you were going to give them a second bite at the apple, why didn't you do it four months ago? Because they didn't know who they were dealing with and that you would know <laughs> what the court's rules are and what they're supposed to do. That's as opposed what they want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a big problem for them. So that's what they did. And so now I filed uh, this morning, I filed an objection to that. And I objected to the fundamental principle, why have rules? The state constitution 73A says, the rules so proclamated by the court shall have the full force and effect of law. Well, those rules were put in place before any of those judges on the Supreme Court were put in that position. So now to give a mulligan, as you say, to the state, right? If the state doesn't want to brief standing and it was given that opportunity by, by the opportunity to brief it and to argue it, now what are they doing? Now they're opening it up to a third party to come in and brief standing when the state refuses to brief it on its own. Why? It's a perfect example of rules for thee, but not for me. Yeah. So this is the controversy on the objection, and so that's going to be uh, a big deal on appeal if we go down if we go down that road. Yeah. yeah. Now I want to uh, I want you to drop your handle on on Twitter so people can follow you follow this case. My mine just so y'all know if you're not following is at Neil N E I L E Johnson. Um, yours is mine is at D Richard N H D first initial. Last name Richard N H, and yeah, not Richards, but Richard. Richard. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> you- and our hours is uh, at GovIntPro for Government Integrity Project. The first three letters of each of those words. Gov. Yep. GovIntPro. Got it. Um, let's see. We talked. Uh, we talked about standing. We talked about the briefs. We've talked about Idaho and how it affects us. Where do you want to go next? Yeah, let me explain to your audience what's been happening to all of us as citizens and voters for a very long time. For a very long time, whenever there's a controversy over your rights, the courts have applied what is some type of test to evaluate the public policy decision-making of the state legislature versus the enumerated, enumerated rights of the citizenry of the state. And for many years, they have done it inappropriately, in, and that's now being changed by the U.S. Supreme Court by the recent precedents that have been established by them in the Heller, Bruin, and now Moore v. Harper cases. And so what would happen then is that in this decision, and by the way, Idaho's Supreme Court in this decision did in fact do the same thing I'm complaining of. They used this means and scrutiny to justify the governmental action of creating a statute for an id right they applied strict scrutiny to the examination and the reason they did is because the state argument is it's it's a state case the idaho case is a state case they're not arguing provisions of the u.s constitution they're not invoking judicial review on a federal standard like i am so that's why this exclusively state case reads the way it does even though a lot of it applies to me and it will be of great use to me is the issue of applying this test and this is what i want your audience to understand this is going away at a federal level in the heller decision many years ago it's been what 12 15 years since the heller decision in washington dc decided that the courts need to stop treating citizens as second class persons in other words when the plain text of one of your rights is implicated by a legislative act for example a restriction on gun control right that's what that case was about yes that the court can no longer apply a public policy test it can no longer apply a means and scrutiny test to discern whether you should tolerate a little bit of abuse from the state that it's in the public's interest that you surrender some of your enumerated rights. No, no, your rights are a no-go zone. The U.S. Bill of Rights, the State Bill of Rights, these are no-go zones. And Moore v. Harper said, what good is an enumerated right if a judge gets to decide if it applies to you or not? He was never given that jurisdiction or authority or, or capacity to do so. And it says it right in, in New Hampshire's Constitution, Part 1, Article 1. All right of government originates from the consent of the people. Every one of the 50 states does the same thing. When challenging a right, the court will apply this means and test 
and we have all this case precedent in the state court levels where this is why we all the Donald Trump cases in the 2020 election were lost because the case precedent was the old precedent right. which it, was applying some type of strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny or whatever scrutiny the case calls for so heller gets as, rid of it as a, as opposed to and bring, cu- as oh, opposed sorry. to custom and usage when the laws when the constitution was written and the initial laws were actually written which comes to being again in the um, Bruin case. That's, that's why. Right. That's why case law sucks, and it should. We should all go back and revert to constitutional law. Amen. Well, mm-hmm. you, you right. bring up a great point, in w- which is warrants great conversation. But to back to your point about the Bruin decision. So the Bruin decision came along, and the court said, "Look, all the lower courts in the federal system and the state courts." You need to stop. So from this point forward, since the Heller decision came out, I'm sorry, the Bruin decision came out, you must, as soon as your plain, the plain text of a constitutional provision applies to you, the burden of proof shifts to the government. Means and right. scrutiny is no longer a permissible judicial test. Now, how does that affect Idaho? And, and that's big. That's it is. really important. It really is. But the Idaho distinction is this. The U.S. Supreme Court did not tell the state Supreme Court how it must adjudicate the matter. What it did say is you must do three things. One, you must hear the case. Anything that has to do with the rights to vote of the citizens of your state, your state Supreme Court, must hear the case. Remember, the Moore v. Harper decision was all about independent legislative theory, where the Republicans tried to convince the state and federal courts that because their power emanated from the U.S. Constitution under Article 1, Section 4, that they were no longer bound. They, they, the courts had no oversight right. over the legislature's action, and the courts, both of them, said no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we absolutely Don't have. Don't think so. And, and Thanks, so, Ry. Well, that's what happened in Moore v. Harper, is it said it, it got very specific that the court must do three things. One is, like I said, you must follow the process. Number two is the... Plain text, as soon as the, the voting rights apply, you must, now, um, you must now adjudicate the matter and you have to follow the state constitution. All the actions that, com- that, are, that I've raised in my case, right, do what? I'm accusing the state government of, re- of failure to follow the due process required to change our election laws. I have taxpayer standing under Article 12. Article 11 is my election rights. Article 12 says, whatever's written in Article 11, you can't touch. And all those people swore an oath to uphold and defend Absolutely. those words in the Constitution. And they look the other way because they're ignorant of the law. Mm-hmm. What's that response from a judge in a, in a real situation? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and the last thing on the, on the decision hey, was... And- no one is above the law. I just want you to know we've all heard that, gentlemen. No one is above the law. He made a joke. <laughs> hey, the, the lawyer in my case at the state from the state's attorney's office, Attorney Conley, that's exactly what he told the woman in Derry when he prosecuted her for flagrant advertising in her media platform that ignorance of the law is no that. excuse. I saw that. And I says, <laughs> well, isn't that the pot calling the kettle, <laughs> kettle black, black, right? <laughs> so, but to close out the Moore v. Harper situation was that, like I said, you have to look at the plain text, then you have to follow the state constitution, and then finally, the co- federal courts maintain supervisory oversight that the court, the state courts can't legislate from the bench. And I would argue that's exactly what the state court has done in my case on Friday yeah. by issuing, soliciting this memorandum of law because now they're trying to put their finger on the scale and they're interfering with the process. Now, I've not had a negative thing to say about the court. I've reserved my, my, my commentary and up until now, and I've just objected to it, so my... My objection is in writing. I preserve that for appeal, and um, and so yeah, that's that's my my take on all of this. So I want to read just a little bit from this objection. This is uh you know there you go, filed with the court, official. It's official, okay. Um, 
Plaintiff submits it would be fundamentally unfair in a deprivation of plaintiff's fundamental due process rights for the court to take this unsolicited and extraordinary measure that will unfairly allow the defendants to have a second bite of the apple. Plaintiff submits the court was aware during the Supreme Court hearing of November 29, 2023, that this appeal and complaint contain alleges of a constitutional nature where the plaintiff alleges a denial of constitutional voting rights that said rights were cited within this complaint that the plaintiff had an obvious personal stake in the case and that the plaintiff alleged actual bias and harm caused as a result of said constitutional deprivation. And I, I think that just sums, I mean, it goes on from there, but that right there, you have as a citizen, the right to challenge. I mean, if you don't have standing, again, who does? Like, who's supposed to have standing if a citizen, a voting citizen, who, it's it's our freaking vote. It's your vote. It's his right. It's his right. I mean, it's like, if he doesn't have standing, who does? An old maxim of law. Failure to follow the process prescribed by law nullifies the outcome. Simple, right? The state government and the federal government has prescribed a process that they must follow. And failure to follow that process is an injury. My injuries are very specific. One, I was denied the right to vote on the town of Auburn on March 9th, 2022, because they tried to coerce me into using a voting machine. That's simple. That really is the nature of the case. And my argument is... You had no authority to change the manner in which the Constitution requires that you sort and count the votes. See, our state Constitution requires the selectman, the moderator, and the clerk to be three eyewitnesses, three sets of eyeballs, to watch the moderator sort and count the votes. And then They didn't do it. that. So when they went and changed by statute and granted the town's dis- discretionary power, that's an, uh, an act of unauthorized and undelegated powers. If they want to change it, they can use Part 2, Article 100, and get a constitutional amendment. And that's the summary of my entire case, that each of the things I've complained about have been violated. They violated the procedural due process required by our state constitution and federal to make these changes. And they didn't follow that process. And now that leads to the secondary problem, which is all of the elections currently being held are, are not following the process prescribed by law. Well, and this isn't just a New Hampshire problem, obviously. Nationwide. So nationwide, this right. is a nationwide problem, and in a lot of little ways, but let's just talk about specifically before 2020 with the COVID practices and all of that, where they said, hey, you know, secretaries of states are all of a sudden just going to issue guidance. Now, guidance isn't a law. A mandate isn't a law. None of this stuff is law. Laws are laws. And laws have, a, like, people forgot schoolhouse rocks. But even laws that go violate your constitutional rights are not null laws. And void. Right. They're not laws. Right. So the Constitution is that, the governing point, law. I mean, it is the highest law of the land. Right. And you guys have a great one here in New Hampshire, your state constitution. Man, live free or die. I mean, it is, it, in fact, what what article is that? I've read this Article thing. 10. Article 10. Give us, give us a little verbatim. Right of revolution. Yeah, That's right it, of baby. revolution. That's it, baby. And really what, it, what right of revolution is all about, it's basically when your government has become so rogue and out of control and is not following the processes, we've given the government limited enumerated rights limited yeah all the other rights are reserved for us right they can't just do what they want to do you finish the end of it where we have a duty yeah we have a duty and we ought to fix the reform yeah it doesn't mean guns and bayonets and marching it basically says go ahead and reform your government that's it absolutely and you know you said something very powerful and most people don't understand the law of the land and what that means i've had people make fun of me who didn't understand what the law of the land means It's a very old phrase. It comes from Magna Carta in 1215. And what it means is if you look up Black's Law definition of the law of of land, it means due process of law. The The last sentence of the state constitution says, every one of these 101 articles are some of the laws of the land. That means every one of the provisions of the state constitution is due process of law you are entitled to due process of law over your entire state constitution 
I call that pretty powerful. Yeah, and and it's just saying that you don't have standing and you get no due process is not due process of the law. It's laughable. That's right. It's a let me give you a specific number of injury. When part of my brief, when you're proving standing, you have to prove three things. You have to prove one how you were harmed, two the causal agent between the accused and yourself, three what how the court can provide relief, but more importantly the physical harm what what is getting back to the physical harm and what is it in my case it is the statistics of the state itself absentee voting prior to 2020 was an average in the 2014 2016 2018 election process four percent four percent is the grand total of the entire percentage of our normal election process at the federal election cycle okay Mm -hmm. that's the biggest turnout what is 2020 32%. 32%. Yeah. 32%. And you don't think that that is a, st- a staggering number? A third of the vote. And guess what? Every single absentee ballot in the state of New Hampshire has been illegal since 1979 because no one is authenticating this voter ID case, right? That's right. No one is authenticating these absentee ballots. The people who vote in person have to produce an ID, but absentee voters in New Hampshire do not. And, that and, they, was and they're supposed to sign an affidavit when and, they cast that ballot. And since I'm quick on math, I will tell you just how staggering 4 to 32, it's an 800% increase, gentlemen. That's it, that's the it, easy math on that. And That's I, their figures, not mine. Yeah, and you know what? This is interesting because I'm glad you brought that up because there is a case uh, in Wisconsin that Donald Trump actually won. And it's so funny because everybody talks about, well, where they actually heard it in the state of Wisconsin, they determined because they called all these voters indefinitely confined. And if they were indefinitely confined, they could just cast these ballots, you know, through this indefinitely confined status, which was guidance, again, by the secretary of state. And Megan Wolf, there's a whole story in Wisconsin. Many people know it. It's it's disgusting. But the fact of the matter is he won that. Now, here's what's interesting. He won it at the end of December. January 6th is coming, right? Do you know his remedy for that was to call the 150-some-odd thousand, I think it was, voters and find out who was actually indefinitely confined. They would not just say... Well, these indefinitely confined. Well, what they could have done was just said, well, let's just go based off absentee and done the percentage and say, well, we'll throw these out. But they didn't do that. No, what they said was the Trump team somehow had to contact in span of a week, a hundred and some odd thousand people and find out who was actually indefinitely confined. So it wasn't going to happen. But had they done it, the state of Wisconsin would have been flipped. Well, yeah, and, and this goes back to what you're saying, Dan, putting the burden on the plaintiff as opposed to the burden should be on the state. Right, and that's what they're trying to do now is they're trying to flip the burden of proof back onto me when, in fact, the burden of proof still lays with them. It right. lays with the state, but just keep in mind that was proved right here in Wyndham, New Hampshire. Yes. Because when you look at what happened with the SB43 forensic audit and the audit report, it showed that those staggering discrepancies in those percentages. That's what it proved. It proved that voters were disenfranchised. That's correct. And Ken, share some of those stats. Oh, well, not not even in Windham, but you could go across uh, multiple towns across the state. You saw the same type of irregularities and discrepancies. You saw people, you saw in the returns of the votes in Merrimack and in... Um, what was it? Merrimack was 22.8% of Correct. overvoted ballots. Right. An overvoted ballot means the votes aren't counted because uh, allegedly the voter filled in too many ovals for any given race. When the, the law was passed, HB 1163, a couple of years ago, after that, the number of absentee votes dropped to almost near zero. But when you get back to the harm in Dan's case... That's the proof of the harm in your case. Right, right. Exactly. That SB 43 audit. Exactly. Because the ones, the, right. the, ones it, the, the violations of the state statutes that allow unqualified voters to vote in person. Unqualified. I can't, I can't prove that because at this stage, I can't get the audit. As the SB 43 was the first time we had a legitimate audit of our election process here in New Hampshire. But prior to that, and without the significant influence that caused that to happen, thanks to you gentlemen, um, that doing an inquiry as to the college kids, for example. Right here in Idaho, and they're getting it right. They're, they, you know, right here from the case, this is like proof of identity. This is uh, Justice Brody's um, 
his uh, opinion here. First page, uh, talking about the proof of identity, removing student identification cards as accepted forms of identification for registered voters when voting at polls. They're going to, they're speaking to the whole qualified voter. Right. Let me speak to that issue because most people don't understand this, and this will be big breaking news. The whole controversy that we're dealing with starts with ni- the 1970s, where my case began, where we saw right. election, the election process wasn't broken for nearly 200 years. Okay, it's a recent set of changes orchestrated to change the way the election process is conducted so that the two political parties can choose how they reelect themselves. And so the big part of that is citizenship. Most people don't understand there are two categories of citizenship. There is citizen of the United States, the, te- the language used in the U.S. Constitution, and then there is a citizen of the state. And isn't one capital in lower cases... Yeah, in the federal constitution, the word citizen of the United States is singular. It talks about an individual person, and citizen was capitalized. So in the seven odd places where it refers to citizen of the United States, it was talking about citizens of the states. It wasn't talking about the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment had to do with making sure that the freed slaves would not be abused anymore under black code, black laws, right? And so they passed the 14th Amendment, which changed the makeup of the republic, now telling the states what it can and cannot do, which then created new federal civil rights that said, you states will not deprive your citizens of due process of law. You states shall not deprive your citizens of the equal application of the law. And so that's what the 14th Amendment, and that's how it's a little different, but the 14th Amendment language was in 1868, and so there was a lot of time that had passed, and it was referring to a generic group of Americans rather than a specific individual identified in the U.S. Constitution. But the landmark case that settled all this was, you won't believe it, Susan B. Anthony. In, In the late 1800s, Susan B. Anthony voted in New York State it was charged with a federal crime. This was what led to women's suffrage in the 19th Amendment. She was charged with a f- state and federal crime because her lawyer told her that the 14th Amendment provided her the right to vote. And so she lost. But that case made a very important landmark decision, which was your right to vote doesn't emanate from the U.S. Constitution. Therefore, your state, rights as a U.S. State. citizen... Are not does not include your right to vote. Go look at the Privileges and Immunities Clause, Article 4, Section 4, right? The right to travel, to go in and out of states, the right to move, the right to immigrate, the right to trade and commerce. The right to vote isn't listed in Article 4, Section 4. And this goes all the way back to the signing of our Constitution yes. with federalism and anti-federalism and so the answer, states won. The answer to this I found in New Hampshire's history in the year 1808 just a a few short years after the Constitution of the United States was ratified in 1788, New Hampshire's legislature provided the answer to all of this. And that was that if you were born in Massachusetts or California or Hawaii and you moved to a new state, the act of immigration was the surrender of your Hawaii citizenship and the swearing of an oath to the New Hampshire citizenship. And that's how you changed your domicile. Your domicile shift was the act of changing your state citizenship status. Let me give you the example. I was a soldier, and when I joined the military, I got shipped to Texas. I was still a New Hampshire citizen because I was naturalized here, but I didn't become a Texas citizen. I was a Texas resident. Sound familiar? And where did you vote? I voted absentee. Where? For what state? For New Hampshire. There you go. Because I was a Texas resident who had still retained his right to be a New Hampshire citizen. So college students who go to school in New Hampshire should vote in their state of origin, which is where they came from. Repeat the story. I'm a soldier, right? Not our elections. The military sends me to the United Kingdom for three years. Same thing. I'm a resident of the United Kingdom. Right, but I'm not a citizen of the England, right, right. Or, or or the United Kingdom, so I voted absentee. So that was the proper use. So what happened in 1973? We took that away, and we started asking the different question: Are you a citizen of the United States or are you a state citizen? Because if you're a citizen of the United States, you can go anywhere, 
right? You're not precluded. The thing is, the catchphrase is, that doesn't give you the right to vote. Your right to be a state citizen is where your right to vote. And changing that is when they added domicile. And that make, that's what makes you a qualified voter. Yes. There you go. That's yes. where we were going with this whole thing. Yes. What makes you the qualified voter. Right. right. It's your citizenship. It's right. not your domicile. And look, federal law precludes using residency as a prerequisite to declare your eligibility to vote. The state so, legislature can't write a statute that says you've got to live within the state boundaries for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or a year, right? So, so kudos to Idaho. They got it right. <laughs> they got it right. This is fascinating. They understand I mean, what a qualified voter is. talk about you know, citizenship. You know, you don't think citizenship of a state. You know, I mean, we how don't think that way of it. I mean, we think you know, residency. I yeah. mean, it's, it's just how we're trained to think. Now. And here right. I thought Idaho was just good for their potatoes. but <laughs> Hey, no, Idaho is good for elk hunting, my friend. Oh, is it? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I love it out there. Well, just I thank Idaho man. right now. Thank you, Idaho. All you Idaho. Is yes. it Idahoans? Any, anybody I- from Ains? Idaho out there in the chat, chime in. We want to applaud you and your great state. I love Idaho. Gosh, I love Thank it. you, Idaho. Yes, thank you. So we'll be using this because the a big part of this Idaho case is the plaintiffs have standing to bring their claims. And the court spends quite a few pages articulating what is a voter's standing, what does voter standing look like in right. the state of Idaho? Yeah. And so that's gold to me. So the courts ask for a brief. I'll give them a brief, even though I don't think anyone else should participate. I would concur with that statement. Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here today. Jennifer. We have. We Thank have. You. And uh, we're going to be, uh, we've got to interview you after this, too, for uh, for future work. Yeah. So. You know, um, it sounds like you're wrapping it up. Yes. Before you do so, you know, we just thanked the state of Idaho for the decision they made. New Hampshire owns a great, owes a great deal of um, gratitude to you, Dan, for bringing these cases, mm-hmm. for bringing the enormous amount of time and research that you had to go through in order to um, go before the courts and put together very plausible arguments. And you know, I well, went, I, I actually sat in the court each time you have gone before the justices and you blew away the state's, well, yeah. you know, attorneys. Not you, once, you, but you, twice, right? You, <laughs> twice, and you made them look like children. Because yeah. it's important to me, and I understand the subject matter better than they do, because it's obvious by their preparation and their response. Lack of preparation. Lack of preparation is that they, one, they don't take me very seriously, and shame on them. Well, and I think it's not only New Hampshire that owes a debt. Anybody who is out there fighting this good fight right now. And so, good you know, point. if I were to look across the nation, uh, there's there's you and you guys here. I can look down. We were just talking about this yesterday, but yeah. down in Georgia, I mean, you got Garland Favorito, David Cross. You've got uh, the the gentleman in the uh, the house down there in Georgia. Uh, there's just Arizona with um, what's his name, Kerry Lake's attorney. Yes, Kurt Olson. Kurt, Olson. Kurt Olson's bringing that right to the Supreme Court, and I mean they they're doing that at risk because you've already <laughs> exactly seen right. other. I mean, look what happened to Rudy Giuliani, Brian Blam. I could go on with a list of people, Sidney Powell, and so on. People who have really put their law license on the line and it's just appalling to me that they're saying oh well you know you want to do this you know we're going to just take away your law license there's nothing in this that's you know i don't what's the word evil or anything of the sort in fact it's the exact opposite it is people trying to assert their rights and actually get the 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 judgment on basic laws it's our duty it's It's our duty it's our civic duty to if in a free government the control of the government, excuse me, self-governance requires citizen participation. That's what I wanted to say. Right. Yes. Right. And so, and then you got the audit the vote PA ladies. You've got Leah Hoops over there. You've got, I mean, there is a collection of people that have kept this ship moving. And I'm going to tell you, if those people weren't here all across this great nation, exercising their duty, as you mentioned, we'd be screwed. Because none of this would have gone anywhere because they didn't want it to go anywhere. But a tireless group, what is that? What's that statement by? Is that Sam Adams? Who is it? Uh, it's not the majority, but a right. tireless, tireless group of individuals. Yeah, something. Hey, I'm going to butcher it right now because I don't have it in front of me. But I look, we, you know, uh, we need to win this fight. I, I, if we don't, we're, we're, we're hosed. We're winning now. 
Yeah, exactly. Thank you again, Idaho. Yeah, I, this is, again, just continuing to press this fight and to, to say, I, I cannot believe that something as basic as standing, saying that a citizen doesn't have freaking standing. This is driving me nuts. I think it's driven a lot of people nuts. And you're doing the Lord's work. I just want to say that. Thank so, you. anyways, um, I'm going to have you guys go around the horn here. I do want to mention my sponsors really quickly again, just mypillow.com forward slash lumberjack or promo code lumberjack. $25 extravaganza still going on, and Midas Gold Group, MidasGoldGroup.com. You can text lumberjack to 232425 to receive free silver with a qualifying order. So, to wrap it up, each guys, each give you like one to two minute summation, starting with Ken. I guess the best way to wrap it up is what I just said. You know, we, we've been in a fight. For a long time, uh, Tom and I, you know, we're, we're looking at what our rights are as individual citizens. And, you know, we're just asking that laws be followed, that our rights be protected. And when someone like Dan comes forward and, and brings a case like this, and I believe it's going to be successful or should be successful, ultimately it will be successful because the Supreme Court has already decided on similar cases and and set the precedent and in this case I'm not referring to it as case law they've already said here are the rules and the guidelines that we must follow so you know I just want to again thank you Dan for stepping up it takes an awful lot of time it's personal time it takes away from family your life your other obligations and I think that it's so important that we have people like you in the state you know, I, I gotta just before we move on to you, I, I'm sitting here listening to Ken in this studio with his soft spoken demeanor and radio voice. And I mean, before we jumped on here, Effenheimer's were Tiger. flying everywhere and he's yelling and Mwah. screaming. Yeah, go on. Yeah, you can't you can't deny the passion, right? I, I, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful for your audience. I'm thankful for all the people in all the states throughout the country who are doing their due diligence to make sure that people are held to account. And that's really what this is about, is holding government officials to account to make sure that they understand that they work for us. It's not the other way around. And it's the tireless effort from all these unsung heroes. You know, and it's... Individuals like yourself, Neil, that provide a platform to get all this information out to, to the collective so people start to understand, people pay attention, people grab a constitution, whatever state they're from, they actually read it and say, wow, I didn't know that these were my enumerated rights. And then they start to hold their government officials to these enumerated rights and say, hey, hold on a second, look, my constitution says this. They get more involved. When they get more involved, there's an education process that begins. And when that education right. process continues and builds to a, to a point, then things start to change. So we're seeing that right now. So as tired and weary as some people have been, because there's a lot of people that have put it all on the line, you know, That's since right. 2020 when everything has come really apparent. And the fact that everyone's still here fighting with as much passion as they had when they first started is a true amazement to me. And that's why I'm thankful. I'm thankful for all those people that are still doing it. The Garland Favoritos, not to name names, but we could go around and spend yeah. the rest of an hour going around. There's a lot of people in, throughout the country that are doing this. And so hats off to every each and every one of you. Yeah, in fact, we've got the quote here because Denise Ann super chatted. Thank you, Denise. And she said, it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom That's in the minds it. of men. <laughs> That's the one. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Great, Denise. All right. How profound. How profound. Um, closing point for me is that um, the state constitution of New Hampshire is one of the most beautiful documents ever written in the history of the world, in my opinion. And the genius of the founding fathers of New Hampshire was the ability to alter the document. And there's a process. And that process isn't being followed. If you don't know your rights, you don't have any. One of uh, the things that I like to focus on is fundamentals. Article 1 of our state constitution says all government, not some, all government of right originates from the people, is founded in consent. Article 2 says you have a right to life, liberty, and property. And your right to protect your life and your liberty is yours. It's a reservation of a private right, not the public right of the state. As someone who spent a lot of time in and around law enforcement, 
uh, I can tell you that the lie told to our society, the government will protect you, is exactly that. It's a lie. They have no duty to protect at all. Yeah, now mention Article 8. Article, tw- Article 8 is that all government actors are your agents, that they are accountable to you at, at all, all times. times. All Not times. sometimes, but all times. And then same thing with Article 38. It says same thing, that at all times your government actors are accountable to you. And so this is what they don't like, and this is what they're pushing back. And I'd like to remind all the patriots out there, don't be discouraged with the pushback. The pushback you're getting when you're standing up for yourself is a result of too many years of these people being in uh, with the belief, growing in the belief system that they can do all this runaway stuff. Yes. So don't be discouraged. Just know that it's part of the process. It took many, many years for our form of government to be altered from a republic into a democracy. So when you hear these Democrats tell you that the Republicans want to destroy their democracy, they're telling the truth. They have successfully exactly converted. Right. They converted a constitutional republic into a national central democracy, and they are on the verge of losing their gains. And the only way they lose their gains is if we, the people, continue to stand up and fight. Yes. What we call that, folks, is weeping, wailing, and gnashing of the teeth. It's biblical. <laughs> this whole fight is biblical. I, I just, I'm going to get a little spiritual on you, but the fact of the matter is that we are in a battle, a perpetual battle of good versus evil. That Amen. is the nature of the life we live. Okay? So you have, you know, and they're not equal. This is the other thing you need to understand. The fight is not equal. Satan is not equal to God. He is a minor player in this battle. Okay? God creates. Satan merely imitates. And that's what we're seeing here. People operating under the color of law, trying to imitate law and act like they're carrying it out, but they are not. The actual created law is the Constitution. That is the highest law of the land. It is your state constitution. It is our federal constitution. It is all of this working together. And no matter what they tell you, that is the law that matters. Their case law, their this, that, their guidance, their mandates, their other crap doesn't matter. You are born with inalienable rights. Among those are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And also property rights are not a minor right. Okay? Don't think. Because your property represents your life. It is your time. Your time is your life. Benjamin Franklin said at one point, he said, Dost thou love life? If thou dost, do not squander time because that is the stuff that life is made of. So by stealing your property, they're stealing your time, they're stealing your life. All of this is your God-given rights. Don't ever forget it. Read James Madison's essay on property rights, 1792. It explains property in its totality. Yes. Great stuff. So thanks so much for listening. Remember, if you're new, subscribe to the show. Please please leave a comment and smash the like on your way out. It really does help get the stream. And share this out. People need to know this. All right? We'll see you on the next episode, folks. Peace out. Thanks, Nick.